All right, so here's the current state of the hoop houses. Smashed up pretty darn good. They've lost all dimensionality. And they're weighted down with snow and ice. And they need to be repaired. And ideally placed somewhere in my garden so it'll be ahead of the game uh, in February when I intend to start planting stuff if this, all, this plan all works out. Let me show you the other one. So, here's the other one. <laughs> I had this over my herbs in the driveway, if you've seen my driveway herb video. And it kept blowing all over the place. It didn't fit properly and I just couldn't get it secured in a way that uh, made any sense, given how windy it gets there. So I put it back here and it's been, you can barely even tell, but... That's, that's it, right? Now that's been flattened out. Now these all need to be repaired. So, stay tuned. Well, hello, I'm here by the sea. Good morning, it's April 3rd here in uh, beautiful spring Nova Scotia. And then today I'm gonna find some squash in my tulip garden. Hi, it's Greg Otten here with MaritimeGardening.com. There's another nice tree. Here's my garden in the background there. Uh, you look way, way up. Look up, look way up. Canadian reference. Friendly giant. See, those are spruce trees are dead. All but one of them are dead. The one on the right there is still got a tiny bit of life in it, but these other ones are Toast, they're just lumber waiting to be used, and they've been dead for a while, so I imagine the wood is probably dry, but not rotten. You, know, you can tell a rotten tree from a really dead tree, because, uh, like the tree on the left there, I imagine is the wood's in fairly good shape, because there's still a lot of branches on the trees. Right? The longer the tree's been dead, the more the branches break off in storms and ice and rain and stuff. The other ones are still pretty good. And I have to go that way. And I have to fall that way. I'll take this one here too. There, done. Alright, so the idea of this video was to show someone working through repairing uh, a hope house but in the absence of uh, any materials uh, I've been putting off fixing these for weeks and weeks and weeks because I didn't have the right uh, I didn't have any lumber to uh, to repair them the, the problem with why they broke was that the lumber I used to uh, build them the uh, shorter pieces on the sides was just too too flimsy to really hold them together in any uh, with any strength at all, given how severe the climate is here with the wind and the rain and all that other stuff. So, uh, rather than go to the hardware store and get uh, lumber and stuff like that, I decided why don't I just cut down a tree. I apologize for the shaky cam work here, uh, camera work here. My seven-year-old daughter wanted to help, so she held the camera. <laughs> so it's a bit uh, all over the place, uh, but uh, she had a lot of fun, so... Uh, uh, bear with me here uh, for the, the skinning of this log. She is the official camera woman, uh, camera girl. Uh, anyway, so here I am just uh, peeling the bark off this log. It's really easy to bark logs in the spring if they're a, li a, a live tree. This is a dead tree, and uh, when a dead tree is dry, it's quite hard to bark them. Oh boy, their camera's really shaky there. <laughs> 
But when it's wet, t today uh, we'd had a lot of snow and then the temperature rose and it was almost 5 degrees Celsius. So it was uh, kind of wet and, and there was a good thaw. So the, instead of that dead bark being frozen on, it was uh, wet and kind of easy to remove. And I decided just to remove it using a knife instead of a, the ideal tool is a, a draw knife. Um, or uh, if you have a live tree, some sort of spud bar or something like that. Um, but I just decided to use a... a Know, a good size knife just to show that you can do it that way if you're if you're so inclined uh, it's uh, I have to say that uh, it uh, I had to cut off a couple uh, major branches there but uh, it probably took about I don't know 25 minutes all in to get the bark off of that tree um, and that's me being out of the if you're doing it every day you get faster and faster at it that's me being a little bit uh, out of shape out of practice and you know, using a number of different holds not all of them particularly safe uh, <laughs> don't take your your safe knife uh, knife safety tips from me uh, I've cut myself uh, a lot um, uh, I was trying to doing this in a rush and I wasn't sure if I was going to put it on camera so I wasn't really uh, editing myself uh, with great care uh, I was just trying to get it done and I wasn't really thinking about uh, displaying uh, incredible knife skills or anything like that uh, also the camera is so shaky even if I was using perfect skill you'd never know <laughs> you'd never know anyways you get the idea I skinned that tree and that tree provided enough lumber for uh, this one hoop house and, and and more. I got a couple extra pieces out of it. And anyway, just showing you here uh, how it was broken. Uh, I nailed the end pieces onto the butt ends of the long pieces, if you understand that terminology. Um, long story short, there just wasn't enough perches there, not beefy enough to hold it in any real way. So I decided to attach these heavier logs using longer screws and in a different way. Um, so um, not only will it give the thing more weight so it's less likely to blow away um, but um, it'll also just have a lot more uh, purchase uh, these uh, even all of that said these hoop houses held up really well I mean I when I installed them in the garden I, I, I took my cues from a lot of uh, other online contributors on, on YouTube and uh, it's so windy where I am. Doing what other people do that works for them. My, my hoop houses ended up blowing all over the place. They even had to fish one out of a tree at one point. Um, so they really have to be lashed down with, with great care when you live in a coastal area. Um, anyway, here's me just making some measurements. I think I cut these each um, 42 and a half inches long. Uh, that's the right dimension that when you attach them to the long pieces uh, you get a, a good uh, bow in the uh, wire remesh that makes the dome part. So uh, I think I had some footage earlier there of me cutting uh, these with a bow saw, but uh, I decided to use a handsaw because it makes a straighter cut. I'm holding it down here because there was it's really windy here and there was all this dust blowing in my eyes, and I think I dropped it there because I had to go cry. Uh, there was so much sawdust in my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, I persevered through all of that, but yeah, a really bad spot. And I suppose the, someone is listening saying, well, why didn't you put safety goggles on? And that's, that's a great idea. I just uh, was trying to get it done, and I was in a rush, and I just sort of squinted and uh, suffered through it. Uh, <laughs> uh, no safety goggles, no gloves, uh, using my hand as a vice, uh, oh, all bad. Uh, bad, bad ideas. But um, anyway, when you're filming stuff, you get the camera out. And you, you're so tired of having to go back to get this thing or that thing. You just say, "Ah, oh, the heck with it," and go with it. So anyway, again, don't take your safety cues from me. I'm doing this in a the way. I'm doing this is uh, likely to produce a hand, a cut in the hand, and the cuts in hands from saws are very bad cuts, and uh, very likely to get sawdust in your eyes. Um, <laughs> So there's that caveat. Anyway, I just cut a bunch of pieces like that until I had uh, enough to uh, to do the uh, the repair that I needed to do to that particular box and uh, all the other boxes. So, uh, oh, here I am just uh, taking my knife and, uh, you know, because some of the cuts weren't perfect, so I'm just cleaning up the edges using the most rudimentary tools possible. And that handsaw I used to make all those cuts, like a, that's like a $20 saw. <laughs> it's not like some special uh, 
tool from some exotic place. It's just like a cheap, I think it's an Irwin, that's a or cheap, you know, generic hardware store saw, nothing special. Uh, I'd love to have a better one, but it's, you know, for now, maybe the next saw, when this one gets dull, I'll get a better one, but for now, this one seems to work just fine. Um, anyway, I cut those as, as straight as I could uh, cut them, so I have a good uh, attachment here. Now, uh, trying to drill these in was a bit of a challenge, and uh, the volume's turned down, and it's a good thing, because there was some serious swearing going on. Uh, really, uh, because it's, you see the way it's built, right? It's got that dome, that wire remesh. It's it's like a giant spring. It doesn't want to hold itself down. So if you're going to do this, I would suggest you get someone to help you. <laughs> Here I am holding the screw with my hand, and I'm also holding it down with my hand, and I'm also trying to push hard with the drill to put in a, uh, I think it was like a two and three quarter inch uh, decking screw. And, uh, well, you wouldn't think a, a Robert's head is a very dangerous head on a drill, but... Uh, I can tell you with all honesty, I've driven Robert a number two Robert's hood, uh, Robert's head right through my thumb <laughs> more than once. In fact, um, more evidence of the uh, poor safety <laughs> practices of the maritime gardener. Uh, anyway, don't do that. Get someone to help you. And uh, my kids just aren't old enough to help me. And my wife was busy uh, doing other stuff. I actually, I know she wasn't even home when I was doing this. She was out shopping. Um, anyway, we got her together and we made it work. So I just did that to both of the sides. Oh, here's the other side. Yes. Um, so attached to this side as well. Um, yeah, I would definitely get someone to help me if I was doing this uh, alone. And part of the reason this came apart was because I had uh, I didn't have a cross member. You're going to see in a second here. There's no cross member holding this together. I, I attached a piece to either end, and then I when you do that, the middle bows out a bit. And so what I did was I attached the middle together with a string, which was really dumb um, because it, it doesn't uh, hold the uh, the frame true in any way. Uh, the two end pieces are doing all the work in terms of holding the frame true because uh, the, the sides want to flare out a little bit if you follow uh, what I'm saying here. Um, so I had to get another uh, piece to put in the middle. Now here I just drilled a screw. This is my trash uh, trash box on the side of my house, but I just... just <laughs> it dawned on me that if I just stuck a screw in there, it would be a lot safer and a lot easier, because uh, it's a push saw. So, uh, instead of having to hold the whole thing now with my hand, uh, and hold it in place and do all that sort of stuff, just by putting a screw in, it made the job a lot easier and a lot safer, so... Uh, do that, if you, or use a proper workbench. <laughs> Step one usually is proper workbench. Anyway, there's me just uh, attaching this on, and the reason I'm doing this voiceover here is because it was so so windy. It's always bloody windy on my property. It was just too windy to uh, uh, to to you know talk through this. So I had to attach this plastic onto the end, and uh, a bit of a quandary because I could not find my staple gun anywhere. It was originally stapled on. Just the same plastic was on there. The plastic, 6 mil poly is tough stuff. You can reuse it a number of times. Could not find my staple gun anywhere, so I came up with this crazy idea just using some old uh, tire tube. Um, you ever go by a bike shop, you'll notice outside the bike shop they usually have dozens and dozens of uh, tire tubes in the dumpster, and my advice to you would be hoard those babies because you would be surprised how many uses there are for tire tubes. In fact, the uh, cold frames I have in my garden, what holds the lids down, <laughs> the uh, the covers, uh, what's holding those on is tire tubes. And I use them in all kinds of different ways. Also, you can you can take a tire tube and cut it in half and tie a couple of bent nails to the end, other uh, to, to either end. You get an excellent bungee cord. You can do all kinds of stuff with tire tubes and people just throw them away. Anyway, that's what I did. I drove a nail through a folded over piece of rubber from a tire tube. And I figured that would, by tacking the plastic down with that, it would, it would give it a better purchase because it's rubber. It's more, uh, uh, you know, better uh, friction or whatever. But also it would keep the sides of the nail from ripping through the plastic under stress. And, of course, it's just what I had. <laughs> it's like, when I'm, how am I going to solve this? I don't want to go to the hardware store. I just want to use this using stuff I got kicking around. Uh, I've always got roofing nails around. 
and uh, uh, always got tire tubes kicking around, so that was the solution. Um, so here I am just uh, tacking those in. Uh, I found about uh, four seem to do the job for each end. I mean, we'll see where what state that's in at the end of next gardening season. <laughs> More importantly, by the, <laughs> some 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 part of next winter. But uh, anyway, seemed pretty tight and pretty snug to me. Um, now to attach the top part. Before, if you remember, when I the original video where I made this, I sort of sewed it on. Um, and that probably would have worked if I'd used better string, but I just used some cheap junk. Um, so here I just um, poked a hole. That thing in my hand there is an awl. Just I made it using a nail and a piece of alder branch. Um, so um, I'm just putting some dollar store zip ties through the hole, tying that end piece on. So I just continued on with that process, and I probably attach them at about five or six different maybe seven different points along that I mean you just use go by feel you can put more you can put less you do whatever you gotta do or do it some other way don't do it the way I did it you use probably a thousand different uh, ways to come at solving that problem there's probably better ways <laughs> you know uh, probably Tyvek tape looped over that taped on either side would probably work great too there's probably you know really limited to your creativity anyway I did that to both sides and uh, uh, once I was done, it was uh, pretty snug. So here's me uh, carrying it down to the garden, uh, Benny Hill style, in super high speed. Um, I just given a sense of how how uh, rigid it is once it all comes together, right? And uh, you know, to to use a Canadian Canadianism, it's kind of like carrying a canoe, eh? Uh, so. Once I got that into the garden, um, I was gonna. I decided to attach it to uh, one of my boxes, but everything's covered in snow, and I want the. Ideally, the hoop house will thaw out that box. Uh, we'll see. You know, it's uh, uh, getting close to the end of January here, but I removed some of the snow to reveal some of the darker. I think that was seaweed there. Um, so we'll see how that uh, how that works. But the idea is, I'll put the hoop house on here, and uh, you know, check it every week and see if it actually thaws the uh, the garden out ahead of schedule. I assume that'll happen. These uh, beds are four by ten in dimension, so I decided to put the hoop house at the very end of the bed. I'm sort of staring at this here, cursing myself for having that post there. I have those posts there so the hoses will slide around the box gardens a little bit more easily without going over my plants and breaking them. Anyway, I decided to put it at the north end of the box. So on, on the side where I'm standing right now, there's about almost two feet more of garden in that box. And the side I'm on, I'm on the south side of the box. So that way, whatever's growing there, which is going to be growing earlier than the rest of the box, will not shade um, the uh, whatever I decide to plant on that south end. Um, because whatever is going to go in that south end is going to go in a lot later. I'm going to guess that I'm, I'm going to just whatever's in that box, uh, whatever's growing in that hoop house. I, I haven't decided. I haven't even done my plant for my garden yet. I should do that soon. Um, I'll just move some of those to the uh, end part, the uncovered part, once uh, it gets warm and they, they get large enough to be moved. Um, anyway, I'm just uh, nailing uh, some uh, two-inch uh, common nails in there, and I'm leaving the head about an eighth of an inch or two millimeters. Uh, so I'm not nailing the, putting the nail all the way in. I'm, I'm getting something to tie onto here with this. Uh, bank line. Um, so I just left the nail head out a tiny little bit, not too much because you don't want to hook it with your pants or your shoes when you're walking by. Um, so the, the initial knot is uh, you make a bite in the line and you tie an overhand. If you if you don't know these knots you can look them up or if you really want I can do a video but you, you make a bite in the rope and you tie an overhand knot. That makes a little loop and then you loop it around that nail and then uh, Part way up, you, you put a trucker's hitch into the uh, rope and, uh, and then secure that back to the main line using a half hitch with a bite in it. 
if anyone wants to see how I did that, I can I can I can do it in slow mo, um, and uh, I can do a video on that if you want. Because uh, all these knots are very useful in a garden for lashing things down, not just for stuff like this, but for setting up trellises and different stuff like that. The more you really don't need to know a whole lot of knots, but there's probably about five decent knots that are handy for things. You're just sort of putting a loop in it, but it's a very special kind of loop that comes out easily. So all these knots can come out in seconds. Um, anyway, you just cinch that down, loop it through, and tie a knot in there. So, yeah, if you want, I can do another video and show that in, in uh, slow mo and uh, sort of talk you through it. Pick a nice day when there's not too much wind uh, for those that are interested. I thought I'd just show. Uh, door here that uh, give a sense of how windy it is. This is a mesh wire. You know, this is a plastic mesh door that uh, I used to go out the side of my garden and the wind did that to that door. It's complete. That's that's the, the, the middle piece. The door is completely smashed and this is a door that doesn't really grab wind because it's made of mesh and it's completely smashed. That's from a good windstorm we had. Anyway, um, I hope that was helpful. I hope uh, you know, just in a, a different sort of episode today, just walking you through winter chores, kinds of things I like to do outside my garden this time of year. I hope you found that interesting. I hope that gave you some ideas. And uh, until next time, get out there, get at it, and have fun in your garden. Thanks for watching.